heard, I had somebody earlier ask me what the theme of my talk is, and I go, there is no theme. It is just a collection of things that are going on at the museum, interesting topics. I actually went around the museum and grabbed a few obscure things and photographed them, and we'll talk about that. Um, hopefully, by the time it's all over, you will have found it to be a little interesting. Uh, about things that are going on at the museum or what we have or uh, and at the end we'll have questions and, and although during my talk today I'm probably not going to talk about the smoke signals a whole lot you're going to ask me questions about it at, at the end when we do the Q&A part so um, anyway so we'll go ahead and get started uh, of course this is uh, the inside picture it's kind of interesting that night I go around and turn the lights off. Of course, I don't go home. I just uh, do other kinds of work. But uh, sometimes the museum looks really awesome with certain lighting when you've turned off some of the lights and other lights are on. Or in the morning when you turn them on. And it's we have the old board where you go and you open the panel and you flip all the lights on. And uh, anyway, at certain stages, it looks kind of interesting. So I've taken pictures like that, and this is this is one of them. Uh, if you've never been to the museum, it's right downtown Pontiac, Illinois, right on the square. Uh, when you walk out the front door and look across the street, there's a beautiful uh, courthouse built in 1875. And so it's a really nice setting, a little unusual maybe for a car museum uh, to be in a downtown setting. Uh, the building used to be five buildings that were built in 1900, and in the 1950s it all became one when it became Murphy's Five and Dime Store. Um, of course, we had to knock a hole in the wall in the back of the car. Anything to do with cars before we went there? Oh, and by the is our fifth anniversary already, so uh, that's kind of snuck up on us. Uh, inside, we rotate the cars quite often. Uh, we have a wood floor, which again is kind of unusual for a car museum. Most of the time it's concrete or tile or something. Uh, the wood makes the cars, I think, look very uh, classy sitting in there. Even this brightly colored pencil of Pontiac looks uh, very well on the wood floor. So. Um, we have a separate display just for GTOs, and every year in September, on the 50th anniversary of the introduction of that model year GTO, we put two new GTOs in. So, of course, this year we're celebrating the, the 50th anniversary of the introduction of the 66 GTOs. So, we have a couple very nice uh, 66s. One of them is that gold car we did a story on in a, a few issues. That's the other one in there. We, we don't have room for the car. I got this picture uh, a while back doing some research, and this was a display that Pontiac had. I want to say this is around 1937. Uh, I have never ever seen another picture of this display, so I thought this was pretty interesting. Uh, from what I can gather, it kind of starts out being together and then one side just kind of slips in front of the other one to make it look like it's getting cut in half right in front of your eyes every time they did it. So I thought that was a pretty interesting piece. Now I did want to tell one story about one of the cars we had donated and eventually in this book, I'm going to do a full story on this car. But let's start out with this about Pontiac in Wichita, Kansas, and Joe Stout is a longtime member uh, and former president of POCI, and his family had this dealership, and I want to say it was on Douglas Street, I forget the address, 1214 or something like that. Well, we can do lots of stories just on Joe's dealership, but uh, they had two Tiger Truck cars, a 66 and 7. And this is one of them. But what we want to look at is the poster that's in the doorway on the right there. And I'll show it up a little bit. It's got a contest. And only one person in the whole country would do this. And you would enter at your local dealer. And this was the little setup they would have. And you'd pull a little yellow. 
uh, sheet out, filled out, and enter the contest. But here's a poster at Joe's dealership of this very contest that was in the picture. And I thought that was interesting that it was in that picture. Behind it, you'll see the brand new Firebird uh, in the showroom right there. So here's a close-up of what the entry form looked like uh, to win the car choice. Well, here is the uh, uh, notice that they sent out to Orville Coy and Casper, Wyoming, who won the contest. So this is a copy of it, the telegram. This is the local newspaper clipping of them. Giving our him behind the, the driver's door right there, accepting the keys to the car. And here's another piece about it. Well, what what he picked was a '67 Bonneville Brome four door because he was a real estate man and he hauled people around a lot, and so he wanted lots of room, and so he picked a great car for that. Well, as part of the deal too, it wasn't just that you could pick out the car, you could load it up with any accessories you wanted. So he basically just went down the list and checked like almost every box. You know, power vent windows, the accessory trunk mat, you know, cruise, air, tilt, you know, you name it, he, he got it. The salesman talked to him of the four because he told him it was unreliable. Okay, because it was a new motor, and I got to think about that, and I thought, well, the 400 was a new motor at the same time. So anyway, so he did not get the 428, he just got the 400, but he got the disc brakes, he got, well you can see on here, he got almost everything. So time went by, Orville kept this car his whole life, and then when he passed away, this is his widow here you see on the left, and she kept the car even some years after Orville's passing. Well then at some point she decided to sell it. And a fella, and I, excuse me, I forget his first name, his last name is Clevenoff. He lives in the Chicago area, he's still a member today of POCI. He went out to uh, Wyoming and got the car. And this is him collecting the car from her this is a picture of her holding that advertisement from when her husband won the car. He ran into a little trouble on the way home, okay? He hit a snowstorm. The car had some mechanical problems. Not We've never run into that, I'm sure. But, you know, I'm, I'm guessing the car probably sat quite a bit in her care after he passed away. And... You know how it is when a car sits for a few years and then you hop in and go cross country and there's going to be some problems probably. Well, anyway, he had some problems and he had some mechanical issues to deal with and a snowstorm to deal with. Well, anyway, he brought it back and he didn't keep it very long, a matter of months, and Ron Panzer bought the car from him. And then when Ron passed away, his wife Gail donated it to the museum. So this is, was, this picture was taken, we dug it out of Ron's building and washed it off and drove it back to the museum on this day where we took this picture. So once back at the museum, we did some more cleaning and checking it over. And uh, of course, Ron put eight lugs on it at one point because he loved eight lug wheels. Um, but the car is completely in original condition. It's never been repainted. Everything's original. Um, it is starting to rust a little bit back on the rear quarter, so we're going to have to address that at some point. But again, I'm going to do a full story with a lot of pictures on this car for the smoke signals. It's a great story and how the car survived and, it's, and how uh, we have it now. Now, at the museum, you wouldn't know unless you live there like me, but the scenarios that pop up are endless and you never know let's say you wanted to donate your car to the museum all i can promise you is it is going to get used and taken care of but i can't tell you how because things come up just like 
Uh, oh, this is a sign I made for Ron that is in the museum that talks about him and the car, by the way. So we also had a Pontiac engineer donate a 1957 boat with a Pontiac motor. He got out of engineering. He put Trans Am gauges in it. Uh, he re redid the whole schematics of the boat. And, and I have a copy of all that. And he donated that to the museum. So we use Ron's car, which he towed with. It has a super heavy duty. I don't know what the classification is, but it's a receiver hitch fastened to the frame. So anything the car can handle, you could pull with it. So we use that to pull the boat around and show it. And so I think Ron would approve very much of, of it. So it's, it's a lot of fun and definitely a conversation starter uh, when we display this. Another car we had donated is this 64 Tempest Custom Convertible. And this is a car, original paint, original interior, it was in Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, and the fellow bought it brand new and had it his whole life. He passed away. It meant a lot to the family. And so um, they used it in parades in later years and just, he loved to drive the car. And so when people donate these cars, and this is her uh, here with Frank Kemp, POCI member who kind of helped with the whole deal. As I listen to people's stories and how they use the car, and we kind of take that into consideration when, uh, you know, once the car is donated, you know, what we do with it. But it, so, again, the museum not being like wealthy, we have to think about how we're going to get the car. If the people did not have any, you know, way of getting the car to us, we have to figure that out. And so, Basically, I kind of contacted friends of mine and connections in the club, and we kind of just, Frank took the car, and he drove it to a friend of mine uh, near Pittsburgh, okay? And then, he, this is my friend, and then other friends from Cleveland kind of got it from there and drove it to Cleveland, okay? And this, that's Rob and his son on the left with museum t-shirts on, by the way. And then here's them coming into Ohio. Well, then he gave it to Carrie Fotsman and Carrie drove it to my brother's house in Lima. Okay, and then I used that as an excuse to go visit my brother. And so then here's him giving me the keys and then we drove it back to the museum. So that, and none of these guys would let me pay them any gas money. And I really appreciate that. So for, for the cost of the gas from Lima, which is not very far to Pontiac, is all it cost us to get the car to the museum. So here it is sitting in front of the museum. Well, you, you'll notice the tires on it. Well, she told me and Frank told me they took and had the car checked out before you know, they made this trip. And it made the trip trip perfectly. So after I got the car and I was looking at it, it had bias ply tires on the back and they are not reproductions, okay? And on the front, it had radial tires. So I'm like, we need to get some new tires for this car. Well, a friend of mine, Dave Sullivan in Pontiac was, had just gotten some tires not too long ago on his Firebird and he was wanting to upgrade to bigger wheels and tires. So we got his red line tire radials and put on there and now and when we took that vice supply tire off one of them on the back had a super big bulge on the inside we were lucky to make it but it didn't make it and uh, so the car looks awesome in pictures okay but it, it you know with the original paint it's not a show paint job but it's a very nice car so again we talk about how we use the cars well just last week the Illinois State Tourism came to Pontiac and wanted to take some pictures for brochures and such and asked me if I had some cars that they could use for pictures. So I got two cars out. This was one of them that we took pictures of. And this is uh, the biggest Route 66 shield in the country, which is in their neck. And that's one of the places they took the pictures. So you just never know. So at the same time, we're kind of promoting Pontiac as a whole when you see 
You know, they'll be on brochures, they'll be on all kinds of things. Oh, and we had, and I think I talked about this before, uh, uh, Sports Illustrated came through and did a swimsuit issue on Route 66 <laughs> and took pictures in Pontiac with some of the cars too. So, like I said, you never know. You never know what's gonna happen. This is another car that was recently donated. Um, Steve Flurry donated this car, and what's unique about it, it's a 92, but it's a five-speed. You don't see very many standard shifts. There he is in the back of the room. So. The reason he got the car, right, was Steve, I was, I was trying to make you sound benevolent and generous. <laughs> so, anyway, so again, it was driven to, to Pontiac and made it there just fine. So, um, one of the things I've been surprised about is I thought when I first opened a museum, people would want to just donate junk cars just to get rid of them. But we've really been having some nice cars um, donated. There is one exception I'm going to talk about in a little bit. I don't have a picture of it, unfortunately. And the party is sitting here in the room, so we're going to get some laughs out of that. But anyway, here's Steve uh, donating the car. This is another car that was donated. Uh, and this is a beautiful 35 Pontiac. And what's kind of interesting about this is her dad who owned this car, he was a longtime POCI member. He had a Pontiac dealership at one time, long connection to uh, Pontiacs. Uh, he, she first donated a 29 Oakland Roadster. And then also this, this story kind of speaks too about modern technology because she followed us on Facebook and she, I would use that car for various things to promote the museum. And she would see that and she called me one day and said, I've been following you on Facebook. I like what you're doing with the car I donated. I want to donate another one. So she sent this car to us uh, and it's a, a car that her dad restored and it's a beautiful car. And again, we have used this for promotional videos for different things uh, there in Pontiac. Sometimes the mayor drives it. Probably many of you know the mayor by now. He couldn't make it today, but um, he, he, like if we have some celebrities or some, you know, person he wants to impress and show them around town, he'll, I'll let him use this car and he drives them around and it leaves a very good impression. It makes their visit very memorable. So, and then we get other things donated as well. This is Routon Pontiac in Virginia, and he donated those letters. Now they don't look very big on this sign, but they're they're probably four feet tall at least. Uh, they were in very good shape. Um, we also had these letters that we got, and. Uh, Frank Kemp is involved in this story too. He called me uh, when the convention was up in Chicago, he, in the Chicago area, he called me and he was at the swap meeting. He goes, I'm talking to this fellow from Arkansas. He's got some Pontiac letters you might be interested in. And he goes, you need to come see him as soon as you get here. So I did, uh, he didn't have the letters with him, but we talked and I expressed an interest in, you know, getting the letters and he did sell them to us for a very reasonable price. But when he told me that they come from Dumas Milner Pontiac in Little Rock, Arkansas, that kind of rung a bell because Dumas Milner was, uh, you know, he had a lot of dealers and one of them was in Tulsa, which I'm very familiar with all the history of the dealers there. So in Tulsa back in the 60s and 70s, we had Milner Pontiac, same guy. Well, I researched him over time, I found out that he would like buy dealerships and like give one to his relatives or something. So he had cousins and whatever that had Chevy dealerships, Rambler dealerships, Pontiac dealerships, everybody. So the one in Little Rock was just another one of his dealerships. And I remember thinking he had a publication called The Democrat that he put out monthly. And on each page was a little bit about what was going on at each one of his dealers or businesses. And I'm thinking, you know, I think I got a picture of Dumas Milner Pontiac in Little Rock, Arkansas. And there it is. So there's the letters and the Indian heads on the building. And I thought how neat that is that we can document. And, and 
If you would look at this picture, if you could turn left and look down the street, right there is the Capitol building. And so it's a pretty neat uh, place where they come from. So I ended up going to Arkansas and we loaded up the letters in the back of the truck and, and brought them back. So we have those too. We get all kinds of donations. A man visited the museum and he told me this story about how when he was in college, he wrote to Pontiac. And what's it say here? It says, when I was a silly college car nut, I wrote to PMD and asked for a new GTO for promotional purposes and testing. Okay, <laughs> and so I don't know if he was really expecting for a GTO to be delivered to his dorm room or what, but what he did get was this picture back from them. And it said, uh, you know, best regards and supposedly signed by John DeLorean. I've not had time to verify if that's the secretary's signature or if that's his signature. I need to do that someday. But anyway, after his visit to the museum, he went home and emailed this to me. And so we have it in the library at the museum. So the, the, I'm just kind of pointing out the range of what might be given to the museum. Uh, a very popular display we've had since we opened is the camp display. That picture we have moved it around some and changed it a little bit. Uh, but it remains a very, very popular display. Everybody can relate to camping in the 60s and the old family wagon or going on vacation. So. Um, we probably won't ever be able to take this display down, not in the near future anyway. We, we might can change the wagon out and do something like that, but it's, it's really a big hit with everybody. Bill Collins, who is a former chief engineer at Pontiac, he came to visit and he made a donation to the museum of a neat, neat little piece. Um, some of you may have read Scott Shields' recent story in the Smoke Signals about eight track tapes. And if you read that and memorized it, you'll remember that Bill was chosen for several years to pick the songs that went on the eight track tapes. So what he did, and, and I misplaced my picture of it. So he sent, they sent him home with a stack of albums and he listened to them, picked out songs, give that list to RCA. RCA sent him an eight track tape to listen to and approve and he donated that tape to the museum. So it's a little piece, but it's got some history and it's really neat. Before I get into this story, I gotta tell the other story on my friend Ted, who's sitting right here. Ted made a donation to the museum of an A-body body. He called me and asked if I would be interested in it. And he said, one side's real nice. I said, okay. So I, I'm picturing, you know, maybe we go in about eight inches and we cut it and we hang it on the wall. You know, we do a fender and a door, a couple tires. That would be an awesome decoration. So he's coming to our show in September. And for whatever reason, the car falls off the trailer and it scuffs up the good side. So he shows up in Pontiac, Illinois with this A-body that's kind of, well, the idea we had might not be so good anymore. And I'm like, hey, appreciate it a lot. Let's go and just leave it. We'll figure out something to do with it. So he does. And I swear, not a week later, I get a phone call from a guy. And he, he runs what he calls pig races. These and, and the PIG, I think, stands for Perseverance, Integrity, and Grit. And it's a obstacle course foot race. And he goes, do you have a car we can run through? I go, do I have a car we can run through? <laughs> so I take and put cardboard around, you know, and fasten it and put like a old carpet in. And I haul it out there to the park. And they loved it. They loved it. And so from that point on, I am like, when somebody calls and wants to donate something, who am I to decide whether we have a use for it or not? I have no idea. Bring it on. So, there must be a reason for it being here. You know what I'm saying? 
another similar story was we had a 301 turbo engine donated and he completely restored it for display you know us Pontiac guys sometimes don't think real hard. and so you know if he just said a ram air a lot more excited you know about it but it was a 301 turbo but i i you know but i said mine i'm like oh. so he does it was an awesome job so again a week or two later uh the trans am nationals calls me can you come and speak and i said sure and oh by the way the other guest speaker is the engineer that developed the 301 turbo how like really how about if i brought one i'll restore it he talked that would be wonderful so i did it it's really a great thing i got pictures of him standing there you know pointing with all these people around and then he autographed it for me and i took it back and it's in a museum so again i'm just almost to the point where i'm who am i to say you know so the donations we get so another kind of thing that went on is this box started the whole thing, okay? This is a mirror box, as you can see, and it's addressed from Pontiac Motor Division to the Kansas City Zone office. And he, this gentleman calls me and he goes, I just purchased a trailer for $100 at an auction and this box was in the trailer. And I said, okay. And he described the box to me and the addresses on it. And I said, can you tell me what the trailer looks like? So he starts describing the trailer to me. And as he's talking, of course, my catalog of memories and thoughts are going and going. And so what I come up with, with was this. So he found one of these at an auction for a hundred dollars. Pontiac made 13 of these in 1972. And they're mobile service training units that were sent to the more remote parts of the country to train mechanics at Pontiac dealers. So the deal was they sent them to the zone office. The zone would fill them up with tools, diagnostic equipment, enough to rebuild a whole engine. And the head service manager for the zone would drive to the dealers and teach. And so you could, it would open up. There was a screen, he could show training films. You can see he has an engine there. There's workbenches that fold out on the sides, have vice on them, the whole deal. What a neat thing. And so it just, I remembered these pictures and I said, I think I know what you got. And the museum would be very interested in acquiring that as a project and I, you know, as a neat piece of history. So we kept talking and we ended up being able to acquire the trailer. So this is me picking it up. So before I went there to pick it up, he's kind of a, of a mechanic type. So I said, would you put new tires on it? Cause he said the tires were shot. Check the bearings. And I sent him a picture of the plug on my truck and he put a new plug on it. And so I went there and all he charged me was what he had in it. And so it was under $500 for the trailer, the new tires and the, everything. So I thought, that's very reasonable and nice of him to do that. So when I got there and I opened it up, you know, and the whole time you're thinking, well, how can I verify that this is what I'm thinking it is? I mean, the box is pretty good evidence. So I opened it up and I'm looking through the sun and there it says Pontiac on it. You can see it. It's like they had hand painted the letters and over time they had faded off of the outside. But for whatever reason, it probably made the fiberglass deteriorate at a different rate. So it was still there. You could read it from the inside out. So I'm like, it's no doubt this is what it is. And then he told me something that later on would be very useful, kind of match the story, is that he said, I checked the bearings and they looked like brand new. He said, I don't think this trailer was ever used. And I said, okay. And I paid him and we hooked it up and I uh, 
we went on to Don Bennett's. I don't know how many you know him. He has an open house at his house, old Pontiac racer. And we went there, and then I drove like 75 miles an hour all the way home, and it pulled off. It really pulled well. And also, by the way, I was explaining this trailer to a friend of mine, and he thought maybe one of the original or you know uses of this style of trailer was a snowmobile. And that makes sense when you look at it. It, it might have originally this design of trailer may have been to haul snowmobiles. So, and as you can see, it's still got the vice on the workbench. This one only had one fold out instead of two. Um, it all looked very original to me. There's what it looked like as I was towing it home. So anyway, I after I got it home, of course I'm I'm like a sponge. I want to. I'm very curious about the history of everything. So I called the guy back and said, "Could you give me the name of the auction company where you got it from?" So he did. And um, so I got a hold of them, and then he he said, "Well, I got it from this farmer." And so I called him, and he goes, "Well, a friend of mine gave it to me years ago. Here's his number." So I called him, and who do you think he was? The zone service manager in 1972 from Kansas City. So I'm like, "Please tell me the history of this trailer." Now you got to remember what was his name? Martin Cesario. Cesario was the general manager of Pontiac at the time, and this came right from the top. When you look at the the information on this car, he's got his name all over it. Like this was his great idea to do this, and so they made 13 of these and sent them out. He said, "When I got that here, I hooked it up and took it to a warehouse in Wichita and stuck it in there. They never used it a day." So that, that verifies what the guy said about the wheel bearings. Why they look like brand new? That's because they were. He said it set that warehouse till 1998. And they cleaned out the warehouse and they gave it to him. He took it home and gave it to his neighbor and friend that helped him farm his land, the farmer. He took it and parked it out back. And it sat there till 2015 when the farmer retired, he hauled it up front and had an auction and this guy went and bought it for a hundred bucks. So that's why the box was still in there with the mirrors for the car to pull it because they had never used it. And so had this thing not had that kind of a history and that box wasn't in there, we'd have never known what, you know, what this trailer was. So the story gets better. I'm in the museum helping a guy do research in the library. And I had all this material laying out on the table. And he's like, what's this? And I said, I, I told him the story. I said, all we need now is a 72 grand mill to pull it. Four door with a vinyl top. He says, wasn't there one of those in the smoke signals recently? I said, there sure was with about 50,000 original miles on it. He goes, I might just would buy that for you and donate it. I go, really? He goes, yep. So I called the guy. He goes, well, I sold that, but I heard that that guy's having some health problems and he needs to sell it. So I called him. We settled on a price. I texted the guy. He sent me a check. I sent it to the guy. A friend of mine went over, picked up the car, drove it to the museum last week. So now we got a four door 72 Granville with a vinyl top to pull the 72 service trailer. And we got front fenders to put those mirrors on. And so who would have ever guessed a story like this would unfold? <laughs> it's kind of the museum at its best in a way because we are able to kind of put all these pieces together and, and, and make these things happen. So if you come to our show in September, this will be all on display. The trailer will be done, getting all kind of you know cleaned up and the letters put back on it and everything. Steve, you got a question? Just answer my question. Yep, it's gonna look so what I did was at the auction, when they had the auction they broke the jack off of it. 
So the first thing I did was I took it to a place in Pontiac that I'd never been to before, but they work on big trucks and heavy equipment. And it was recommended I go out there and I took it out there and told them what I needed. And they put a new one on there for me and, and wouldn't charge me for it. So uh, we got that fixed. Well, then I took it directly over to the sign shop in Pontiac, which if, if you've heard me talk about them before, they're amazing. They restored our chief Pontiac statue, old gym, our 1890s horse, the totem pole. They did the hand lettering on the museum uh, library door. They're amazing. So they took measurements. So I said, look, open it up. We looked through there. You can see the lettering. They took measurements and everything. So uh, at one point, it's going to go there. and We're going to have the lettering all put back on it. So uh, it'll be pretty neat. So that that's kind of how that's all all going it anyway so, so did you ever make the snowmobile connection no i i think it was just probably in michigan of course snowmobiling is very popular you know even back then and i'm sure there was just the dealership of trailers that you could go buy snowmobile trailers and that's what pontiac did they probably went and bought 13 of them and if you notice the one that we got is slightly different than the one, but it's very, very, very close. And they're only about 12 feet long and they got two axles why they tow really. They're heavy duty, they, they tow really nice. So I'm just guessing about the snowmobile thing, but it really looks like it makes sense. That that was one of the original uses of that type of trailer. So, but yeah, the cabinets inside are all like brand new. Uh, there's a little box in there with extra wheel bearings and parts for the trailer, spare time still hanging on. I mean, it just was kind of a time capsule. If that guy had not parked it outside, it probably would have still been like new on the outside too. The hubcaps totally rusted big time. So I'm going to have to try to find some new, they're just like baby moons, you know, chrome hubcaps, nothing special. But uh, anyway, just a really interesting story. Um, this is one of the displays also in the museum, you know how I talked about the 301 turbo, we're kind of get, getting a collection of engines. This is a half and eight four cylinder that I restored for display. I'm working on a 59 tri-power now for display. Uh, we got a, a, a 32 Pontiac V8 on display. Um, so we're getting some very interesting, I'm kind of on the hunt if you got one at home in your garage and I don't care if it's messed up or not, it's just for display. Wouldn't mind getting like a Fiero Super Duty. That would be an awesome, uh, unique engine to display. But anything kind of unique in Pontiac history, drivetrain wise, I see someday us having a whole room uh, and being very neat to have all that. But this is our garage area and this is where we bring the cars in and out. So, so. And also that visor, that came from uh, the GM Training Center in St. Louis. So, oh, and I forgot to tell you, the guy, the zone manager, I'm like, well, why didn't you use the trailer? And he's like, well, it's only a couple hundred miles to the training center. That's nothing for us out here. And I know what he's saying. I lived in Oklahoma for many years. I suppose in Pontiac, Michigan, where the population and the cities are such that, you know, in 50 miles, you can get to a lot of places. And if someone told you you had to go to 200 miles to the train center, they probably think that that was a, just a huge trip. But if you live in Kansas or Oklahoma or West Texas, that's just what you do to get anywhere. So the, the service zone manager just thought that was totally useless. But I just thought how, how, a, the, how the company is so big that the head guy can come up with this idea, send you this thing, which had to cost at the time a lot of money, and you just decide that we don't need that. You know, I just thought, wow. That's <laughs> but anyway, so that's that. And then I would say ever come to these, but lots of other Pontiac clubs as well. So recently, there's some awesome things go on at the museum. Recently, the Bandit Tour come through. And so when I was telling them at the city about this, they're, they're of course familiar with the movie, but they were not familiar with the bandit tour. 
And I said, well, it's where these guys that like the movie and got trans ams and all get together to scrape, you know, and have fun. And, and there's some of them dress up like the sheriff and dress up like big and little Enos Burdett and, and all that, you know. And so I, they go, well, how many? And I said, well, I think there'll be a hundred of them. Trans Ams, and I said, there's the semi-trucks, there's the police cars, and they ended up spending the night in Pontiac, and so anytime an event comes to town, they spend the night, the city really likes me, because, you know, that means they get some income from it, and so they, that's another reason they kind of help support the museum, is events just like this. So they came, and it was a great time, and the city entertained them, and there was a hundred Trans Ams there. So it was really a neat thing. The weather was perfect. We made Trans Am cookies for them even. <laughs> so we can't beat that. Is that hospitality or what? <laughs> and I'm missing a picture here. I actually had a picture of the mayor with the sheriff. Maybe it's in the wrong place. Um, this leads into another project we're working on. So you never need to wonder what it is I do all day, okay? Um, Upstairs in the museum, we're trying to get that kind of fixed up to display. Um, it's part of the behind the scenes tour that we offer. So what we did was we knocked out a wall in between two rooms to make one bigger room and we're gonna be putting in an art gallery that displays original artwork from Pontiac designers. And we've collected you know, a few pieces and uh, so right now, the other day, we put the first coat of primer on, so it's coming along pretty good. We just gave the go-ahead for the lighting, from the come in and put the lighting in. Um, this is a piece, that first piece I showed you was from Jim Yu, and this is from Bill Porter, um, and it'll be in there. And now this is Mickey McGuire, the tall guy. And he was the Pontiac art director, and they're looking at a Van and Fitz piece. Well, we have four of those as well. Um, and this is one, and this is called a rough draft. And it, if you look closely, it's not too rough to me. The detail on the car. Of course, if you remember the story of Van and Fitz, Art Fitzpatrick did the cars, Van Kaufman did the backgrounds. Now, Van's backgrounds were a little rougher in the rough draft than was Art's cars, if you know what I mean. His rough draft cars were pretty well finished cars as far as the illustration goes. But if any of you are real 64 nuts big time, you will say to yourself, well, doesn't that girl have blonde hair in the ad? She does. That's one of the little changes they made uh, in between the rough draft and the final version of it. So we have four of these, and one of them's from 59, their first year. And what was so wonderful about it when, when these come up, of course, Art was still with us, and I was able just to call him up and explain what I had, email him pictures. He called back and said, yep, those are the real deal. And we felt comfortable in getting those, so we knew what they were. But they will also be on display uh, in that art gallery upstairs. So I, like I said, I went around the museum and just pulled out some things I thought were pretty interesting. Most of you are familiar with the little posters that they sent out starting in 65. If you look at the bottom of the ads in the small print, it would say like send in 25, 35 cents, get you know some posters, get a spec sheet, a decal, and those would come in a tube. Well, this piece is to the dealer. And of course, this is for 68. And so it is not in a tube. Inside, it has these pages. Of course, it has the spec sheet and all the posters. But then there is a letter and then the sheet on the right. And the whole thing was saying about how boys would put these up in their room and how you should order some to give away to young people, which was their market for the GTO. So it shows this young man laying on his bed in his room with the posters on the wall behind him. And uh, I just thought this was an unusual piece and this is the only one I've ever seen of, of these. And then here's a really awesome piece. Uh, Sam Swope Pontiac opened in 1966. You'll see their grand opening celebration. This was a piece 
that they gave out at the celebration. I'm sure they probably sent a mailing out in advance, but this was like a piece from the grand opening. And what's so neat about it is what's, and you see the buffalo nickel at the bottom. It's on the reverse side, and it has a picture of this. So th this is Chief Big Tree, and he's 101 years old in 1966. It says here that he was the model for the Buffalo Nickel, but what I never had heard before, it says he was also the model for the well-known Pontiac emblem. I'd never heard that, never read it, seen it anywhere in Pontiac history. I'm wondering how Sam Swope know that, you know, knew that. I'm sure he just didn't make it up. But anyway, Chief John Bigtree was at his grand opening in 1966. And I've not had time to research to see how old the chief lived to be, but I just thought this was an awesome piece. And then one of my favorite pieces is the baseball bat that Pontiac sent to the dealers in 1968 to demonstrate the new Endura bumpers on the GTO. It came in a tube called an Endura bumper kit. And there was a baseball bat and a letter about how you could demonstrate the new bumpers on the GTOs. I've actually heard of these and seen a couple before. And I thought, and, and I'll tell you, the bats are the same, but the, the baseball player on the bats are different. So don't think you get one of these. Mine's Veda Pinson. I think he played for Cincinnati. If you get a, one of these and it has another bat that's not Veda Pinson, you're still good. It, does have to be an Adirondack bat though, but it could have a different player I've seen on them, okay? But what you may not have seen is this piece from the following year. I've never seen another one of these. It's called the Doubters Kit. You'll look at the different people and what they're holding. They're looking very confident, aren't they? Yeah, they think they're gonna be able to mangle the Endura bumper on the Pontiac with their stuff. Here's in the inside, you got a hammer, you got the little black piece there is the side trim they put on 69s. You know, remember the trim on the side? That's Endura, I didn't know that until I got this. That's Endura. And then of course on the Bonnevilles and so forth, they had the Endura on the front and the center. And they also had some Endura on the back bumper, if you remember that little insert piece in the back bumper. Endura was very expensive. And they never, they had always played with having an Endura back bumper, but the cost was prohibitive, so they never did it. But they did end up putting that little strip. So here's some of the places and, and how you could demonstrate in 69 on the Endura bumpers and all the places on the cars that had it. But then check out this next picture. They're not quite so confident, are they? You'll notice his golf club's a little mangled up. Her umbrella is kind of bent, and they're not smiling because they didn't win. I just thought this was a really cool piece. And then this is a piece my wife got for me for a gift that she found. And this is a salesman. That, that is the Pontiac Master Sales uh, uh, emblem on there. Oh, and this reminds me, I got to tell another story. I didn't have time to get a picture, but when we were talking about the donations, this is another awesome story. We got a phone call from a former dealer, and this happens from time to time. Not unusual, they're getting on in years, he's cleaning out, you know, he sold the dealership, or, you know, and the conversation usually is, you know, I got some literature, got some sales awards, and so forth. And, and uh, but then he asked me if I'd heard of the masters, sales program, which started in 1970. And I'm like, yes, I have. And what they did was they started this new thing and it was golf related. And they would have like uh, Jack Nicholas come in and speak. It would usually be held at a golf resort somewhere down south in the winter time. And that would be the sales meeting. And, and if you met certain criteria, you would get an award. And it was really, they made a big deal out of it. Well, he said, well, they had an award at Pontiac Motor Division in the administration building 
and you would get your name on there in 1970 if you met the criteria and got the award. And I, I'm starting to think, well, this sounds like something different. This sounds like a one-of-a-kind piece. And so I said, can you describe the piece to me? This is where it gets interesting. He goes, well, it's about seven feet tall. It's about three and a half foot square. And if you bring a trailer, I got a front end loader that can lift it. And we can put it on there. And I'm like, oh, okay. Can you send me a picture, please? And so... He sent me a picture and sure enough, it's made out of marble and it slopes up and you know about up at this point there's a big crest and it's got the Pontiac Masters emblem on there and anyway, you just never know who's going to be on the other end of the phone or what it is. But what another piece of awesome one of a kind history that, that we're going to you know be able to save. And, uh, and on the other end right there in Pontiac we had a salesman uh, Don that I mentioned in the smoke signals and he was a high performance guy he raced he ordered all the judges 455 HOs for all the little guys he's long since been retired ever since I moved there I've been begging him about you know what do you got in your basement you know what do you got because they all took something home just a matter of how much thought he might have some paperwork different things so he never really come up with nothing. Well, a couple weeks ago, he's, I'm moving to Texas to be with my kids. I go, and he says, I'm packing up, cleaning out. He brought me just a couple little things, you know, and I'm grateful for whatever, you know. And uh, so the next day, all his kids had come to help him pack and move. And his daughters were in there and telling my wife, about all these awards that they put out to the curb but trash. And we just looked at them like, yeah, we just put them out there, like go home right now. Go get that box and bring it in. And they did. But as much as you tell somebody, stuff still gets thrown away every day probably, Pontiac history, but we're doing our best to save it. But anyway, this is a piece Penny found and I've never seen another one, still have not. Here's what it looks like inside. It's like a travel kit with all kind of awesome stuff in it. And it looks to be complete, but a neat quality piece, quality piece. And then this was a funny story. This guy come from Sweden. And of course I cannot talk with Swedish. Is Lars in here? No? I can get him to tell the story. The guy come in and he was curious. Well, he goes, where I live, I live, on and there's a guy across the lake, rock in front of his house, and it says, you know, Ford Estates or whatever, okay? So, him being a Pontiac guy couldn't let him get away with that, so he said, I got a bigger rock, a Pontiac Hill on there, and, and he said, a friend of mine carved this briefcase for me, and I carry it everywhere I go, so I just... In his Swedish accent, it was pretty funny, but he was not going to let the Ford guy get one up on him. So that was the gist of it. So you, you've all seen these little uh, juniors, 56 juniors around. I thought I had come across in the last few years some interesting pictures. This is kind of like the production line uh, of them being made. And... Uh, there's also one of these in Pontiac where I live and I've been trying to acquire it for the museum with no luck whatsoever. And kind of my approach with him, I, you know, of course, I just kind of politely, you know, bring it up and that, but I really wish, you know, deep down that he would either restore, and I don't mind if he wants to keep it, it's his, that's fine. But, you know, hey, why don't you fix it up, restore it, preserve it, you know, or if you're not gonna do that, give it to us, we will, you know because that, that'd be an awesome piece to display in the museum. But anyway, I've been finding these pictures on the internet, and I just thought they were really awesome pictures to do with these little cars. And actually, if you search on the internet, there's a video of someone getting, these, getting one of these for Christmas and taking it out and driving it, and it's in color even. So there's another awesome picture. Are those pedal cars or like... They're electric. They run off a battery. Yeah. So, now there's a guy, now, 
Merle, are you in here? Merle got one of these and he knows the guy he took it to and he he what he made you a windshield for it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so and Merle stopped by and showed it to me. It looks awesome, so he kind of stepped it up a little bit, but these are, are really neat pieces. So this is kind of a funny piece. I come across this a typical dealership about 1979. He, this particular guy, Larry Hopkins, he's a Pontiac Honda dealer. But as I tend to do, I really look these pictures over, looking for anything unique, you know, anything strange, or in this case, something humorous. So I'm looking at the window of the dealership building. Now keep in mind, he's a Pontiac Honda dealer. And look what it says on this front window. Pontiac takes on the imports. So, so there's just something funny about that. He's selling the imports, but he's taking them on at the same time. So, we just got this car at the museum for display. So um, again, the smoke signals is going to benefit from this because I'm going to photograph it. I already made arrangements with a track nearby to take it there and photograph it. And the owner has turned in a story. Uh, Keith Brabeck is the owner, and he's gonna he he's done a story. So we're gonna have that in a future smoke signals. This car raced in 31 NASCAR races, and it's okay to cry when I tell you this. It blew up 11 Ram Air 5 motors. <laughs> yeah, this car is probably responsible for killing more Ram Air 5 motors than any other car. But anyway, it's beautifully restored. It does have a Ram Air 5 in it now. And um, it does rattle the windows. It's an awesome car. And then I got to thinking, you know, around the museum, we've got some pieces that have, of course, a lot of dealership names. This is like the ultimate in the name of a Pontiac dealership. Chief Pontiac. How much better does it get than that? Well, here's another one that's pretty good, too. And like Whitsonville, Massachusetts is Indian Pontiac. And if any of you have a car that was sold at Indian Pontiac, this guy turned in a whole bunch of these uh, invoices to me. And so I have a copy of your original invoice if you got a car sold new at Indian Pontiac. Another awesome name for a Pontiac dealership. And then there's Indian Head Pontiac that was in Vermont. Another pretty awesome name for a Pontiac dealership. And then there's some not quite so awesome or don't quite add up. And here's one of those Packard Brothers Pontiac. And my friend Alan in Pontiac has a 69 Judge that sold new at Packard Brothers. Here's a couple more pieces I've collected from Packard Brothers. But wait, it gets worse. It gets worse. Ford Brothers Pontiac. <laughs> This is almost an insult right there. And would you buy a car from a con? <laughs> con Motors. I wish I'd had more time because I have one from Hatfield Pontiac and I'm sure if I dig long enough I would find Pontiac. But anyway, I thought it was kind of fun to go around. And we talked about the Masters a while ago. Did you know that Jack Nicholas bought a Pontiac dealership and there was Jack Nicholas Pontiac and I'm sure there was other famous people I know Rusty Wallace had a Pontiac dealer uh, probably was other famous people that own Pontiac dealers and then quite by accident I was this is downtown Broken Arrow Oklahoma where I used to live and my wife went back for a visit and she happened to be driving downtown and wait a minute what do I see they were taking the facade off this building and uncovered Pontiac Tempus. And this used to be town and country Pontiac in Broken Arrow. And of course they have totally redone this building and once again covered this up. I think it's still there, but they've covered it up once again. So she happened to be there at the right time, right place at the right time. So it worked out really well. And then every year at the convention, I always think of John Sarek. I don't know if you guys do, I miss him. And I think about him because he always would come and speak and I loved his talks. 
And this is a picture of John in my garage, Broken Air, looking at our 24 Oakland Touring. And again, having the museum, this is another great car because the 24 Oaklands were the first cars in the auto industry to have the quick drying paint. And this one has the original paint. So again, I'm gonna do a story sometime on this in the smoke signals, but uh, still always will uh, miss John. Thought I'd show that picture. Um, of course, I saw Arnie with us, and here's an old uh, flyer for racing, in it, and it's it's got Arnie on there. I thought that was a neat piece that I found digging through the museum. And then, like I said, we have a lot that goes on at the museum. We had the smoking event at the tour come through. Well, they have four cruise nights a year, and the first one we had this year, there was probably... Oh, there was a lot of cars. I don't know, 200, almost 180 or something. But I bet over half of them was Pontiacs. Couldn't believe it. It was awesome. So we have cruise night. And again, you can see the museum in the background. It's right out on the square downtown. Um, we also have our Pontiac, all Pontiac show, the third weekend of September every year. So if you can, please come to that. See the trailer all fixed up. Um, it'll be an awesome event. And one of the things we're going to do there, I'm sorry? Was that the courthouse in the back? Of it was. That's the 1875 courthouse. Yep. And that's my friend Dave Sullivan. And those are the tires that ended up on the, there's Dave. That is the tires that ended up on the Tempest I showed you. So right there you go. But no, um, yeah, it's a beautiful courthouse and they've restored it all. And you can't go through it during the week, but on the, or on the weekends, but during the week on business hours, you can just walk in there and, and be sure to go upstairs. It's really beautiful. Um, we're gonna have a special display this year of uh, newer limited edition Grand Prix. And believe it or not, I've already got like a dozen of them lined up. And I th I've never seen such a display. Uh, we're gonna have one and hopefully two real pace cars. This is, of course, one of the 1500 you could buy at the dealer, but we're, they had like three real Daytona pace cars and we're getting, I already have one lined up. Hopefully I'll have a second one. So some really interesting, there was a lot of interesting uh, of those newer Grand Prix limited editions. Here's another one, the two plus two. Um, and again, that's the courthouse, the Lincoln out front. And then in the future, we're going to do some things on um, 73s. I put with my wife that I'm ahead of the curve. I've always liked 73s. A lot of people don't like them, and, but they're kind of starting to come on a little bit. And uh, so we're going to do a little bit. Here's a couple more of them. But what, what you will find, and I can tell you from experience, they quit making reproduction stuff in 1972. And if you are going to restore 73, it's going to be a little more of a challenge, which if you like the challenge, it's a perfect car because, you know, they make so much stuff for the 72 on back, but not so much on the 73s. Um, guys with the Grand Ams, same thing, can Ams. I think they're all starting to come on a little bit, but they're finding the parts are tough. So here's another car we're going to do a story on. And this car has an awesome story. You're going to see this in the smoke signals. This is a 76. Grand Safari, nearly 5,000 pounds of it, 19 and a half feet long. This one has an awesome story because uh, it was ordered by the zone office in Florida and used to haul dignitaries around at the Daytona 500 that year. Then they sold it to a foundation in Virginia who used it to haul people back and forth from the Washington DC airport to their facility in Virginia. And this car is loaded. It's got almost every option. You can see the vinyl top. It has remote mirrors both sides, 4060 bench seat power both sides. I mean, you name it, it had it. Because the zone ordered it. Nobody had to really pay for it, I don't think. But anyway, um, so then in 1981, I believe it was, when Ronald Reagan was shot. Is that right? Is it 81? They made a TV documentary about it, and they used it in the documentary. And this is the car, you can see it there in the middle, 
and the, all the Secret Service guys were in it, and it was going to the hospital in this sequence here. And you can see it pulling up to the hospital, and they all are piling out of it to run in to see the president. So it has a little bit of history to it. Uh, it's an awesome car. This is another car. It's a Raymair 2 Firebird that we had on display in the museum, and we're going to do a story about it, too. Um, those have gotten to be, of course, very collectible. And this is a beautiful red, red interior, four-speed car. So, And then I've gotten so many comments about Carol Knight and her story about the Oakland going down the Yukon. It's one of those stories you couldn't make up, you know. And she actually was invited by the Arizona chapter to come and speak after that story came out. And the chapter members say it was one of the best meetings they ever had. Well, she contacted us recently and said she has another story of that car she wants to submit. And it's basically the story of the car after it reached the lower 48. Her parents actually went to, on a sightseeing tour and went to see the Alamo and all over in the what was it 1948 or so, I think was the year and she has pictures and going to tell that story so she was very excited about the story and being invited to the meeting and the whole thing so uh, there will be at least one more installment with her talking about the old Oakland and then if you've been reading Tom's uh, a series on the road to Motorama upcoming soon is going to be about the plexiglass Pontiac. This picture was taken at a POCI meet in the 70s and Don <coughs> Barlow owned this car at that time. Uh, it recently sold and went to Russia and we will probably never see it again. So we have been lucky enough to dig up some awesome pictures from a photographer in California who he worked in California and a guy that I know ended up with all of his negatives and he sorted through and got all the Pontiac ones out and in there was some awesome original pictures of the plexiglass Pontiac that we're going to be able to use in the story so and then did anybody do like me and when GM announced they were dropping a Pontiac go to your local dealer and take pictures or are you not as goofy as me okay well anyway I did that and I come across these when I was putting this talk together and I thought, you know, it's just been long enough that I will get these out. Of course, as time goes by, these will probably become more interesting to look at. But um, a lot of us were at, the, you know, went to visit the dealer, but did anybody stop to take pictures while I went down there and took some pictures? The GH are still a very, very desirable car, um, even today. So there's the kiosk with with all the stuff on it. So, there, this is what you would have found in 2009 on the showroom floor. And there's what the modern looking sales, salesman's office looked like at that time. And I tried to get that rug. <laughs> it didn't work out, but I really did try to get that rug. But, I, I couldn't make it happen. And then here's another awesome story I'm going to have to do in a smoke signal someday. I need more info from the guy. But a guy walks in from Wisconsin, Milwaukee, one day. And he said, I, I was a policeman there. And it was our cars that was in that ad. And of course, me being the Pontiac geek that I am, I knew exactly what ad he was talking about. It's this ad here with the 77 Le Mans's. And he had a real funny story about it, another ad. Anyway, he went home and sent me this picture of his Milwaukee Department Le Mans, and he said that, and I don't know what he called them, but the people, you know, that did the ad came to his police department, inquired about, can we use some of your cars? Well, he said that you know how they check in like Adam 12 every morning, you know, on the beginning of their shift and the sergeant or whoever tells them what's going on that day. He said, we were in that meeting and he stood up and told us about what was going to happen. But he said that they told him their cars didn't look enough like police cars. So they had to paint them to make them look like police cars. And they just got the biggest laugh out of that. And anyway, so... 
I just thought that was a great story. But yeah, that's the real deal right there. So anyway, this is a uh, this is the end of my talk, but this is a barn fine 28 GMC with the split head six Pontiac motor in it, and it's still sitting in the barn. Can't can't get him to pry it loose, but there it is, something every day. But does any okay? Does anybody have any questions about anything? Yes. Okay, he's asking about space for storage. You're not supposed to ask that. Okay? <laughs> you can ask my wife. My my motto is to always fill up the next building. But um, it, it is a concern. Um, we don't really sell donated cars. We're only considering selling one at this point, and that's because it kind of freaks everybody out. It's a hearse. It's a uh, 1986, and I. And, and again, we take into account the people who donate the car and what their thoughts are in the donation process. Like that lady, if I sold her 64 Tempest convertible, it would break her heart. I mean, I would never do that. This guy drives down from Canada, drops it off, and gets on the Amtrak and goes back home. And he's like, his wife wants it to be gone kind of thing you know and he's really not concerned what i do with it and because nobody seems to show any love for it in pontiac either it's something we would consider selling and so we will do that we have a couple cars that are kind of well we acquired a tempest the 61 that that motor come from we're eventually going to strip that car just get the drivetrain out to display and, and it'll be gone so it is in our thoughts about the cars and where to put them, but so far, you know, we're okay, but it, it is in our thoughts and something we got to deal with. I mean, anything but the cars, there's no problem. I mean, like even the seven foot award, you know, we got, we got room for it, but um, yeah, it's, that's a good question, but I don't like to think about that question a lot. <laughs> yes. How many people visit every year? Yeah, he asked how many people visit every year. We get around 20,000 visitors a year. Um, there are a lot of them are doing Route 66, and we're actually in a very good spot for that because a lot of them, I'd say 90% of people doing Route 66 start in Chicago. And Pontiac is usually on their first day they're stopped, so they still got some money. <laughs> they are not tired of being on the road. They're all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and we get to see them, so it's, it's a good place to be. And uh, so in our gift shop, we have Route 66 things and Pontiac things. So we have two distinct types of visitors. And what's neat about this, and what I try to explain to people, that the museum is kind of the only brick-and-mortar thing that's Pontiac. You know, we're there seven days a week, and we teach people about Pontiacs, we answer all their questions, you know, what's up with Chief Pontiac? How come it's named that? Um, you know, all kinds of questions. And what's the Oakland? Never heard of that. So we really get to educate people every day about the history of Pontiac and about the cars. And the stories we get from people who have had them, or, you know, even overseas, you'd be surprised how many people from overseas have Pontiac stories. So it's, it's really the only place, I mean, the conventions are wonderful, wouldn't miss it, but we're basically kind of preaching to the choir here. You know, all the people that come here, you're Pontiac nuts already, pretty much. You're, you're not reaching out too well with this kind of a thing to educate new people at a convention, but at the museum, we get to do that every day. So it's kind of a neat thing that way. Yeah, Steve. Probably. And years gone by when I was president of Grand Prix after Tim and Larry Edder. And I said, wow, what are you doing with our little newsletter? And it looks great. And I've had every smoke signal since 1984 as president. And we've had some good editors. But I had to call Tim after the Australian issue went out. I didn't know what to say. I mean, this issue was just over the top. I was
but I'm in a perfect place to do it. I mean, we got the world's biggest Pontiac library right there. Yeah, and and we got Pontiac cars coming and going constantly. Like I just showed you about the the Ram Air Five NASCAR car. I mean, so stories are coming to my door basically. So it's the perfect situation. Well, I mean, there are okay. Well, he ha he's asking again where specifically the cars go. We have, I think, at this moment, like 53 cars around town. So 18 fit in the museum. There's a shop down the street, some of you have seen 10 go in there. Uh, my friend Alan Finkenbinder has three large buildings and he just bought a house with another large building and I'm doing my best to fill them up pretty much. <laughs> so some of the local people don't like me probably because they would like to bring their car in there during the winter for like three or four months. And Alan would charge them rent, you know, but now I've kind of taken some of their spots, I think. But anyway, uh, and then we there's a, a house, a vacant house on Main Street that belongs to a friend. There's two cars in that garage. Um, and so they're literally all over town. Well, the shop down the street is, we have a toolbox in there and we have actually an engine a hoist. Uh, and so we can, and that's where I clean them up and stuff before they go to the museum. Or, and that's kind of a holding area when they're in transition, coming and going. So the shop is kind of that place where we can work on them, clean them, kind of come and go through there. That's where you put the judge. It was, yeah, that's where I finished the judge was in that shop. That's where I dropped the vice on my foot. Yeah. So. Do you still own that same wagon? No. Since I am not a millionaire, I sell that to finish to pay for the, the judge. But I still kind of have a hand on it because it belongs to a friend of mine. And should Penny ever let me to have it back, uh, I know right where it is. So. And, and real quickly, I'll, hopefully I'm not boring you with these stories, but they went kind of through a harrowing, harrowing experience driving that car home. And it was a good, we did, we did a little work to it. We put some new uh, lifters in it and a cam because it was getting kind of flat, but it has the 455 in it. But um, they, their family rented, has anybody seen the movie RV with Robin Williams? They did that. They rented an RV and they were out west and on their trip back to Ohio they stopped by and picked up the car. So they had their two sons, they had his wife's sister and her son with them. So his, my friend's wife, Marcia, got in the wagon with two of the boys. Her sister and the other boy was in the RV. So they're going down I-80, like you leave Pontiac, you go north, get on I-80, head east. And all of a sudden, smart, now what's funny about this is Rob told me his version from the rear view mirror of the RV. She told me her version from driving the wagon. And I had just put new brakes on the wagon for him, okay? So she starts hearing some squealing tires. There's a semi right beside her. She starts hearing squealing tires. She don't see anything. She's looking around. The truck is slowing down a little bit. She's slowing down a little bit with it. Then all of a sudden she sees the front end of a car at the front of the truck. The truck is pushing this car sideways down the highway. And this, by this time the smoke is starting to really come in. They're both slowing down. The semi truck starts fish, you know, tailing. Um, then the car comes loose and goes like this and she's looking right at the driver of the car. Rob is up front. All he sees is smoke. He lost vision of the wagon. Does not see her. That car then goes around like this and hits the wall over here on the side. She keeps going straight like a NASCAR wreck through the smoke. And Rob tells me how he 
sees the front of the wagon coming through the smoke. <laughs> and he's just like, wow. And they're all about to wet their pants. And they pull over at the next exit just to catch their breath. And they're sitting there and the highway patrol comes in and they ask, and the lady was fine in the car, but the wagon did great. The brakes worked. They didn't get a scratch on it. And so they immediately bonded with the wagon <laughs> on the trip home. And it's just like, what a story, you know? So anyway, any other questions? Nope, thank you all for coming.